Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Atlanta Council. Um, welcome to everyone here and those who are watching on C-SPAN and in our live stream. My name is William Wexler, and I lead the Atlantic Council's work on the Middle East. I'm delighted to welcome you here today to an event co-hosted by our Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security and our Global Business and Economics Program's Economic Sanctions Initiative. This event is on the record, and uh, please tweet if uh, you are so inclined, and if so, please use the hashtag Shaping Sanctions. Um, today, we are here, of course, to learn more about Hezbollah and its finances. Um, Hezbollah is one of the most sophisticated terrorist organizations in the world and a key destabilizing factor in the Middle East. Iran is Hezbollah's primary patron and has reportedly provides a terrorist or, uh, group with hundreds of millions of dollars annually. Um, this money has advanced the Iranian agenda of undermining Lebanon's political system and its delicate sectarian balance challenging the role of the Lebanese armed forces as the sole legitimate protector of the country's security, providing on-demand proxy ground forces for uh, Iran's war in Syria, um, maintaining a top-tier terrorist capabilities in the region and really throughout the globe, and directly threatening Israel. But in addition to its direct financing from Tehran, Hezbollah has built its own worldwide network of financiers, front companies, and operatives that facilitate the procurement of weapons and dual-use goods for its activities, um, again, in Lebanon and around the world. Uh, moreover, some senior Hezbollah members have facilitated and engaged directly in illicit activities um, that bring the group and themselves uh, additional revenues, including narcotics trafficking and practically every kind of uh, global crime. In his remarks that we're going to hear today, Marshall Billingsley, the Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Terrorist Financing, will address how the Trump administration's maximum pressure campaign against Iran has targeted Hezbollah's global business operations, including its, both its direct transfers from Iran and its independent global illicit activities. Clear signs have already emerged that this campaign has been successful in limiting the revenue currently available to Hezbollah. Time will tell if those limitations will materially diminish Hezbollah's ability to fight in Syria, undermine Lebanon, threaten Israel, and continue to maintain perhaps the world's most strategically worrisome terrorist network. After talking, Marshall will be joined on stage by Missy Ryan, a national security correspondent for The Washington Post, for a brief moderated discussion. They will then open the, form, uh, the floor to, for the audience for questions. Uh, there will be uh, microphones around the room. Um, I do have to stress that when asking questions, please make them brief. And as is said in Jeopardy, in the form of a question, not in the form of a monologue or a soliloquy. Um, before I hand over the podium, uh, let me just uh, close by saying a few words about our two participants here today. Before becoming Assistant Secretary of the Treasury, uh, Marshall Billingsley was Managing Director with Deloitte Financial Advisory Services, running its Federal Business Intelligence Services Group. He previously held a, a number of government positions, including Deputy Undersecretary of the Navy, Assistant Secretary General of NATO for Defense Investment, and Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations and Low Intensity Conflict. He also served as a senior professional staff member on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He, own, he holds degrees from Dartmouth and the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts. Missy Ryan is uh, really one of the Washington Post's best reporters. Um, she covers the Pentagon, the full range of military issues and national security in general. Before joining the Post in 2014, she worked as a correspondent for Reuters, where roles included Deputy Iraq Bureau Chief and National Security and U.S. Middle East Correspondent. She's reported from Egypt, Libya, Lebanon, Yemen, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Mexico, Peru, Argentina, and Chile, and I'm sure I am forgetting a number of countries. She was a White House Fellow from 2012 to 2013 and is a graduate of Harvard's Kennedy School and Georgetown University. Now, please, everyone, give a warm welcome to Assistant Secretary Billingsley. Good morning. Thanks, Will, for those kind words. Ambassador, good to see you, and it's good to see all of the, the members of the audience here and those online to talk to you today. Thank you to the Atlantic Council for hosting this event. And Missy, thank you to you for moderating. 
Uh, I'm pleased to return here today to the Atlantic Council to discuss one of our nation's most critical national security challenges, and this is the illicit financial networks that sustain Iran and its proxy Hezbollah. The Treasury Department, alongside our interagency colleagues, has been the tip of the spear in advancing the administration's maximum pressure campaign against Iran and disrupting support to a wide range of terrorist organizations. This mission is at the heart of our work in the Treasury, and it is central, as I said, to this administration's efforts to secure our homeland, to promote peace in the Middle East, and given the fact that Iran and Hezbollah mount globe-spanning plots to ultimately protect the safety of all people around the world. I had the heart-wrenching experience this past summer in July to attend the 25th anniversary memorial of Iran and Hezbollah's bombing of a Jewish cultural center in Buenos Aires. I raise this because the sinister symbiosis between Iran and its proxy Hezbollah finds no clearer expression than the EMEA bombing in Argentina. Perpetrated by a Hezbollah suicide bomber at Iran's direction and with Iran's support, that particular massacre took the lives of 85 innocent civilians and wounded hundreds more. Again, this was a Jewish cultural center that they attacked. It followed a similar bombing just two years earlier in Buenos Aires against the Israeli embassy that killed 29 and injured many others. These attacks were not singular events. They were not anomalies. Rather, they exemplify the evil that Iran and Hezbollah stand for. Since then, plot after plot, some successful, some not, demonstrate their continued intent to shed innocent blood as they seek regional domination and influence. As a case in point, Iran and Hezbollah together have backed the Assad regime in Syria as it has slaughtered hundreds of thousands of civilians and displaced millions more, including many now displaced into Lebanon itself. And that illustrates the length to which they will go to further their nefarious aims. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing to cripple the Iranian support network. Iran's economy bankrolls its aggression. That is why Treasury is actively targeting Iran's key industries to drive a realization by Iran's supreme leader that economic collapse is inevitable if Iran does not stop its sponsorship of terror and its proliferation activities and return to the negotiating table. We are focusing in particular on oil, which is Iran's primary source of funds, as well as other areas, including banking, petrochemicals, shipping, and crucially, metals, steel, aluminum, copper, and so forth. All of these sectors help benefit Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps, its Quds Force, which of course ultimately is the patron of Hezbollah. A central element of our work involves identifying and dismantling the international networks that are illicitly supplying the regime and its proxies with revenue. In recent days, you have seen us focus on a joint Iranian Hezbollah oil for terror shipping network, which we have targeted now three times under our terrorism authorities and with other actions in tandem with the Department of Justice, Homeland Security, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and the Department of State. We did this first in November of 2018 and twice within the past two weeks. This network alone has illicitly sold more than half a billion dollars worth of Iranian crude just this year, predominantly again to the brutal Assad regime in Syria. This network is operating at the Quds Force commander, Qasim Soleimani's direction. It is a network of 37 publicly identified individuals and entities and vessels which in turn is actually operated by Hezbollah members on behalf of Soleimani and the QF. And it relies upon layers and layers of intermediaries to ultimately obfuscate the role of the Quds Force in this scheme. It is this nexus of terrorism and oil that drives our continued pursuit in recent days of the vessel Adrian Daria I, formerly the Grace I, which is among the latest of Iran's evasion efforts. As our sanctions, legal actions, and related efforts against this vessel and its captain show, we will relentlessly pursue those who undertake or assist such efforts. It is also important to stress unambiguously that Iran lied to the United Kingdom and Gibraltar, promising the Adrian Daria would not go to Syria. 
But that's precisely what it did. Releasing the Adrian Daria and its cargo from Gibraltar was an expensive mistake. It risks putting more than $100 million into the coffers of the Quds Force and Hezbollah. This is something that never should have happened. Our allies should not need reminding that Iran cannot be trusted. But perhaps, just maybe, this experience will be remembered in the future. Of course, it is not just Iran's oil sector that is funding terror. Such conduct also goes to the very heart of its financial apparatus. The United States has exposed three times in the past year how senior officials at Iran's central bank, the banker of the Iranian government, and ostensibly the supervisor of Iranian banks, actually facilitate financial transactions to the benefit of both the Quds Force and Hezbollah. Central to such schemes is the widespread use of deceptive practices to obscure who the true participants are, the beneficiaries are, and the ultimate purposes of the banking activity is. These illicit means include misusing banks and exchange houses, operating opaque procurement networks, many, many front companies and shell companies, and of course, as I've just mentioned, exploitation of commercial shipping. In working to degrade Iran's ability to fund terror, the Trump administration has designated, let me be very clear, the Trump administration has designated more than a thousand individuals and entities using a range of terrorism, WMD, human rights, and government of Iran-focused activities. We're also working to prevent and disrupt this activity through diplomatic engagement, private sector consultation, a wide range of industry advisories, information sharing, and all of the things that my office does that you don't necessarily see splashed on the front page. Our efforts are having an impact, clearly, leaving Iran with scarce funds to spend in its perfidious pursuits. Consider the following indicators. The IMF has predicted that Iran's GDP will now shrink by at least 6% in 2019. Since April of 2018, the Iranian rial has lost more than half of its value, sinking to a historic low, in fact, in September of this past year. Our call on importers of Iranian oil to refrain from contravening our sanctions has resulted in Iran's oil exports falling to, depending on estimates you believe, around 500,000 barrels per day as of August according to a wide range of, of estimates. That's compared to the peak production of 2.5 million barrels per day following the JCPOA agreement. The Iranian parliament itself has acknowledged that Iran's oil sector will shrink by at least 18% this year. Foreign direct investment and business activity within Iran has all but evaporated as the risks for the private sector continue to grow. Over 100 financial firms have cut all ties with Iran, and that includes SWIFT, which is the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunication. Iran's largest commercial airline, Mahan Air, has been banned from landing in the UK, France, and Germany, and multiple other jurisdictions. The consequences for Iran continue to mount, and they will do so for as long as the regime maintains its current course. I'll now turn to talking about how this all relates to targeting Hezbollah's illicit networks. As a result of the pressure that we are applying to Iran, Hezbollah is also feeling the squeeze. Hezbollah fighters have been furloughed or assigned to the reserves where they earn far lower salaries. Media employees have been laid off. Payments to the families of fighters have been slashed. And in March, Hezbollah's leader, Hassan Nasrallah, bemoaned Hezbollah's financial situation and called on his supporters to increase donations echoing his previous call for a jihad for money, quote unquote. Nasrallah has since increased his exploitation of charitable donations, diverting that funding to pay for militants, as well as relying on political coercion and intimidation of bankers and the central bank itself in Lebanon to squeeze Lebanon's financial sector for money. In fact, we designated one of his thugs, Amin Sherry, who was a Hezbollah member of parliament, and Nasrallah's point man for physically threatening the bankers of Lebanon. Amin Sherry, and I'll talk a little bit about this in a minute, Amin Sherry was the point man for orchestrating Hezbollah's use of a bank in Lebanon, which we have now sanctioned and is entering into liquidation, but I'll come back to that. Hezbollah receives the bulk of its funding from Iran, of course, as mentioned. Actually, we thought probably around $700 million a year in its heyday following the JCPOA and the pallets of cash that were delivered to the Iranians under the previous administration. That, of course, has been greatly reduced in this day and age. 
But draining Iran's revenue alone is not going to simply deplete Hezbollah's coffers. Hezbollah supplements its income by using businessmen to operate a wide range of companies to gain political relationships, to gain favored contracts, and even monopolies in prominent sectors. As one example, one of the most egregious examples, a key Hezbollah financier who has now been designated as is his son, Mohammed Bazi, exploited his political connection with the now deposed Gambian dictator, Yahya Jameh. Through human trafficking and the supplying of underage girls that he would personally select out of the Syrian refugee camps, Bazi built a global network that spans Europe, the Middle East, and Africa, all to Hezbollah's benefit and negotiated key concessions in the Gambia to gain a monopoly over the supply of electricity and oil to that country. But Hezbollah benefits in this manner from a wide range of other international criminal schemes. It includes money laundering, it includes drug trafficking, it includes counterfeiting. This is the party of God that engages in these activities. And these networks are operated by Hezbollah supporters, sympathizers, and members. And this is undeniable. Illustrating Hezbollah's links to criminal activity, this past April, the Treasury Department designated Lebanese money launderer Kasim Chams and his Lebanon-based Chams Exchange, which moved money on behalf of Hezbollah, but not just Hezbollah, this same network was moving money on behalf of the Colombian narcotics organization, La Oficina de Envagado, as well as a Lebanese drug money launderer. And this network spanned across Latin America, moving tens of millions of dollars a month for the narcos and the terrorists. It is a textbook example of how Hezbollah benefits from criminal syndicates. Just as we've done to Iran, we are demonstrating our unfaltering resolve to dismantle Hezbollah's financial infrastructure, root and stem, we will rip it out. Since 2017, the United States Treasury has denied agents of the terror group access to the global financial system at an unprecedented rate. We have designated more than 50 such specific individuals and entities alone. Jamal Trust Bank, the bank I just referenced with respect to Shari. We targeted this bank on August 29th. This bank illustrates how Hezbollah has penetrated seemingly legitimate firms. Jamal Trust has had a long-standing financial relationship with key Hezbollah entities such as Hezbollah's Executive Council and Lebanon's branch of Iran's Martyr Foundation. And that Martyr Foundation, by the way, is the organization that funnels money to the families of killed or imprisoned terrorists, including suicide bombers. It is what enables Hezbollah to subsidize those who commit acts of atrocity against innocent civilians. Additionally, Jamal Trust maintained a very deep tie to the Al-Qard al-Hassan structure, which Hezbollah uses as commercial cover for some of its financial activity. In fact, all senior officials from Al-Qard al-Hassan had to do was walk through the front door and identify themselves as affiliated as such, and that allowed them to then open personal bank accounts through which they conducted Hezbollah business. Jamal Trust Bank's downfall was not brought about by a simple lapse of AML CFT standards. No way. They knew their customer, and it was Hezbollah. This action sends a signal that providing financial services to Hezbollah will put an entire business at risk. For too long, Hezbollah and complicit companies like Jamal Trust Bank have prioritized the terrorist agenda of Iran at the expense of the Lebanese Shia community. Jamal Trust Bank broke Lebanon's own laws and violated the public's trust. And we expect Lebanese authorities to ensure that there are consequences for this, starting, as I mentioned, with immediate liquidation of the bank and ending with a full range of civil and criminal consequences. One final point on Hezbollah. We are also using long existing authorities in new ways, particularly in partnership with our Department of State. Here I'm talking about the Rewards for Justice program. By incentivizing people to come forward with information regarding Hezbollah's financial mechanisms, we have received tips from across the world. Leads are now coming in from South America, West Africa, and Lebanon itself. We recently expanded the RFJ program to elicit tips on the Quds Force oil smuggling network I discussed. Let me use this opportunity to send another clear message to the private sector. If you give us information that leads to the financial disruption of Hezbollah, 
we will reward you for it. We will pay as much as $10 million, in fact, for such leads. We encourage people to come forward and take advantage of this offer. What I'll now do is pivot quickly to a discussion on international cooperation and engagement because the United States is by no means alone in this effort. We enjoy the support of a broad range of actions by friends and allies across the world. As I finished our U.S. presidency of the Financial Action Task Force over the past year, this gave us another opportunity to galvanize the international community. At the plenary this past June in Orlando, the FATF for the first time reimposed a financial countermeasure on Iran, calling on all jurisdictions in a mandatory fashion to require increased supervisory examination for branches and subsidiaries of Iranian banks. And the FATF also agreed to reimpose two additional countermeasures this October if Iran still has not done what it promised to do more than three and a half years ago. They lied, and they have not performed what they promised to do, and that is ratification of the Palermo and the TF conventions. And if they, in fact, have not done so by the time the FATF meets, I fully expect that enhanced reporting mechanisms and increased audit requirements for Iranian branches and subsidiaries will be required by the FATF. Now, these actions seem very technocratic, and they are. But in the banking world, what I'm talking about here translates into real costs. It also raises the stake for Iranian banks whose illicit activities invariably will be discovered through intensified regulatory scrutiny. Our joint act actions, our collaborative efforts, leveraging the intelligence community, law enforcement, policy communities, have clearly demonstrated a coordinated approach by this administration to Hezbollah. But as I mentioned, we're also working very, very closely with allies. In May of 2018, for example, the Terrorist Financing Targeting Center, which is located in Riyadh and comprised of all of the members of the Gulf Coordination Council, Saudi Arabia is the host. But Bahrain, Kuwait, Oman, Qatar, and the UAE, together with us, all of us together, designated Hezbollah's senior leadership including members of Hezbollah Shura Council, as terrorists. Together with our Gulf partners, we designated Hassan Nasrallah as such. We're also greatly encouraged by steps that are occurring in the United Kingdom, the Netherlands, Kosovo, Paraguay, Argentina, all of whom have explicitly prescribed Hezbollah as a terrorist organization and have done away with this complete fiction that there is a military or political wing. This is a fiction that even Nasrallah rejects. Again, we're gratified. And now we must use these authorities that have been announced in these various countries to concretely disrupt Hezbollah operations. So together with our partners, we have taken major steps towards depriving Iran and Hezbollah of the funds they need. But preventing another EMEA bombing, another Burgas, another Syria, requires the resolve of the entire international community. And we do call upon the international community to see, based on clear evidence that we continue to present, that purchasing Iranian oil funds terror, funds group like the IR, groups like the IRGC, groups like the Quds Force, and Hezbollah itself. Opposing terrorism means not funding it, including by not buying Iranian oil, full stop. To this end, we must and we will continue our aggressive campaign of sanctions actions to disrupt illicit Iranian and Hezbollah activity. As Nasrallah has said, and I quote, as long as Iran has money, we have money, unquote. We heard him loud and clear. Today, as a result of our efforts, both parties have a lot less. Less, however, is still not enough. We at Treasury, in tandem with the rest of our government and our international partners, will relentlessly deprive these terrorists and their sponsors of the funds they need to shed innocent blood. Of course, terrorists and their patrons will always try to find new ways to fund their malign activities, but we can and we must identify these schemes and stop them in their tracks. Terrorists will try to slip past our sanctions, but we can and we must preserve the effectiveness of these critical tools. Terrorists will always need funding, and we can and we must criminalize such conduct and punish those who engage in terrorist financing to keep the international community safe. Again, I greatly appreciate Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, Wexler uh, uh, for hosting me here at the Atlantic Council. It's great to be back with this team, with this community. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with Missy and to the audience, and I welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I 
everyone hear me? All right. Well, thanks very much, Assistant Secretary. Uh, thanks for your detailed overview of what um, the Trump administration is doing vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Hezbollah and its uh, and proxy activity related to Iran. Um, uh, we have a bunch of questions, I'm sure, in the audience. So we're going to do um, a moderated discussion up here for about 25 minutes and then open it up to uh, uh, the folks sitting in front of us. Um, and I want to start with a very easy question for you, which is, um, how does the departure of um, John Bolton affect the pressure campaign vis-a-vis -vis Iran? It doesn't. We are implementing the president's policies. The president is the one who has directed us on this course. Uh, and we will maintain this pressure campaign. In recent days, uh, both Secretary Pompeo and Secretary Mnuchin have said exactly that. Okay. And what would be the impact on what, on all this work that you've been doing over the last 18 months um, if there was a decision, um, as the President seems to have suggested, that he might consider to ease some of the financial pressure um, to pave a way for some sort of meeting or negotiation with the Iranian leadership? Well, I think the President said precisely the opposite, which is that he is prepared to meet, mm -hmm. uh, but that we are not easing up. He will negotiate from a position of strength. Um, we have from, the, from day one said that the purpose of the pressure campaign is to compel the Iranians back to the negotiating table. So the objective has always been a discussion. The Treasury Department, when we impose our sanctions, uh, in fact, we say this in each and every sanctions release that we issue, that our sanctions are d designed explicitly to cause a change in behavior. But absence of change in behavior, there will be no easing up. Okay, so just to clarify, so the Trump administration would not consider easing up in any way prior to we, you know, like Uncle we, meeting or... We, yeah. we continue to engage in robust and, and uh, unadulterated targeting of the Iranian networks and Lebanese networks as of today. Okay, great. Um, and can you tell us um, how the new executive order that was announced earlier this week impacts Treasury's ability to target Hezbollah in regards to the kind of um, measures that you were talking about during your remarks? No, thanks for that. Uh, uh, that that release of that executive order was a, a really big deal. It was the first time that we've been able to modernize the cornerstone uh, of our financial counterterrorism authority since right after 9-11. Mm -hmm. uh, and what the revised and expanded executive order does for the Treasury Department is it smooths the way, it, it gives us new authorities, but it also smooths the way to allow us to much more effectively target terrorist leadership. Mm -hmm without having to specifically associate a given leader of a terrorist organization with a given specific terrorist attack. Mm -hmm. It allows us to, um, to also go after those who engage in training overseas mm -hmm. uh, for terrorist activities, uh, or even just conspiring to do so. Uh, and very crucially, what it does is it applies, or it gives the Treasury, I should say, the ability now to impose secondary sanctions on financial institutions who continue to transact with terrorist organizations notwithstanding the sanctions designations. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis what you said um, regarding the leadership and, and um, their uh, links to um, particular texts, does that imply a lowering of the evidentiary standard at all? or? or, or? Uh, no, not, I mean, we still will meet all the evidentiary standards uh, that both the Treasury uh, legal team as well as the Department of Justice mm -hmm. require. Uh, but it explicitly allows us, once we've proven that a given individual is in fact the leader of a terrorist group, it allows us to target them without specifically tying them to any particular act of violence. Great. And you mentioned um, in your remarks that um, Hezbollah was believed to receive um, $700 million a year from Iran at a certain point. Can you um, provide the audience with a ballpark of what what the impact has been of the activities that you gave an overview of? How, how, how much reduced is that at this point? Uh, I could, but I'm not going to be able to give you a specific figure, but it's quite, it's quite a dent in his budget. Uh, Nasrallah has been reduced to conducting unseemly telethons uh, to try to raise money. Uh, he's now threatening, he just issued a speech the other day, threatening the central bank. Um, he is feeling it for sure, and he'll tell you that. Okay. And if the goal is reducing Hezbollah's, or one of the goal is reducing Hezbollah's ab ability to act as a, a um, powerful militant organization in the region, um, what, how do you all measure how successful you are in that regard? Um, and if the overall military balance in the region doesn't ha appear to have changed dramatically, you know, Hezbollah 
um, may have pulled some forces out of Syria, but um, even members of the Trump administration have said that they've increased their activities, for example, in Yemen. Um, there are you know, ongoing links between um, Hezbollah and uh, organizations in Iraq. They still have this big missile arsenal. How do you measure the sort of concrete operational impact of what you're doing? Uh, well, I mean, that is that is uh, one of the toughest things to do in this business, right, in the terrorism, counterterrorism business. Uh, what ultimately, I don't think maybe those are the right metrics. Rather, what I would suggest is that it is incumbent upon the Lebanese political system to unify against Hezbollah for the threat that it poses to democracy and the financial integrity of the government of Lebanon. Uh, this is not something that is uh, an obligation of the United States or our allies to solve for the political parties of Lebanon. This is the obligation of the Lebanese people themselves to protect their democracy and to expunge this terror group from, from its activities in the country. Ultimately, that's the objective and that's the key metric that uh, would determine success, not degradation of terror activities here, there, or yonder. And how do you take into account the sort of overall political stability um, of Lebanon, which, as you know, has been delicate, um, to, say the, um, to say the least, in recent years, and given the um, significant role that Hezbollah play, plays in, in their political space? Well, uh, the, the Iranians only have one play, and the play is to sabotage Arab democracy through the establishment of proxy groups that insert themselves into political discourse, paralyze democracies as a result, mm -hmm. and engage in violence to supplant uh, the legitimate uh, security forces of the given country. This is what they've done to Lebanon. This is what they're endeavoring to do in Iraq. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's important that, that all political parties fight back against this. Uh, Hezbollah, unfortunately, has been allowed through a series of disastrous political alliances to insert itself into the daily political discourse of Lebanon and to establish itself as a blocking function on their democracy. And the Lebanese people have got to understand that at the end of the day, Hassan Nasrallah does the Persian bidding. He is not looking out for the interests of the Lebanese people. Um, and one more Lebanon question. Uh, will the United States uh, consider, or are you considering extending sanctions to Hezbollah ally, allies within Lebanon, Christian groups, or other Shiite parties? I won't prejudge or forecast Treasury actions, but when we act, we act with precision and decisively. And we've made clear, if you provide material support to a terrorist group, we will target you. Okay. Um, let's talk about Yemen. Um, in a recent op-ed, um, Brian Hook characterized Yemen as Iran's other terror front. Um, and said that Iran is seeking to build a, a new Hezbollah in, in Yemen. Um, uh, at the same time, there is a hope that the United Nations will be able to broker a peace agreement um, sometime soon to staunch the, um, the humanitarian losses in Yemen, which is, really, which is now the world's worst humanitarian crisis. And, and I, I think there's an acknowledgement by everyone that the Houthis will have to play some role in the political transition um, within Yemen, how are you thinking about um, the Houthis as um, what you know the Trump administration describes as another proxy actor of the Iranian government, and then the need to deal with them, the international community, and potentially the United States directly, um, to get Yemen to a better place? I mean, that, that's an excellent question. There are a lot of strands to that, and the vast majority of those should properly be answered by the Department of State. What I can tell you is that the contribution that the Treasury is making to the crisis in Yemen is along several lines. One is that we have, I mentioned the, the, uh, the TFTC, the Terrorist uh, Financing Targeting mm -hmm. Center, which uh, was the result of a uh, summit meeting that President Trump had early in the administration where all of the Gulf nations agreed to join together. Through the TFTC in Riyadh, we have designated multiple different terror actors in Yemen including ISIS Yemen, Al Qaeda on the Arabian Peninsula, right. uh, and the linkage, there are linkages there uh, uh, both for and against the, the, uh, the fighting with the Houthis. Um, we also have very, uh, we've engaged in a series of efforts to degrade the way the Houthis are receiving funds and material support by the Quds Force. Mm -hmm. I won't go further into that. 
finally, uh, one of the often overlooked roles that that my office plays is we support central banks around the world, and we're working very, very closely with the courageous central bank of of Yemen, mm -hmm. who ultimately had to flee Sanaa and uh, relocate to Aden. Uh, so we, we work and meet with them quite often to provide support to them together with the Federal Reserve and others. But do you think it would be a potential impediment to the, the hoped for peace process, which hasn't gotten very far, to designate Houthi leaders? If they engage in activities which are sanctionable under existing authorities, they, they should beware, absolutely. But I want to be very careful about uh, casting some broad uh, net uh, regarding a, a very definable ethnic group. Mm -hmm. um, just a, a quick question on the uh, Terrorist Financing Targeting Center. Um, to what extent has the uh, Gulf crisis affected the operations there? Well, it really hasn't helped. And, you know, we really urge all of the Gulf nations to, to find a way forward together. We are very appreciative that the Saudi hosts um, have been very flexible on this. Uh, and have uh, enabled the work of the TFTC uh, with Qatar uh, to continue on a collegial basis. Mm -hmm. There have been a number of, of designations, joint designations uh, that have been issued by the entire group as well as parts. Uh, in fact, one of the most recent actions we took against Hamas uh, financiers operating out of Turkey was in partnership with Oman. Mm -hmm. uh, but we organized all of that through the TFTC. So it is, it is functioning. Um, but we would like to, to move past the Gulf dispute. Okay. I'd like to talk about Syria a little bit more. Um, you mentioned um, the role of Hezbollah fighters in Syria. Can you could provide any more detail about how the, um, the sanctions and the financial uh, measures that, that you discussed are affecting that, their role? Um, and to what extent is that changing because of those actions? And it may be difficult to, um, to distinguish these two things. Um, to what extent is the Hezbollah role changing in Syria because of the American pressure versus you know, the war being at a very different stage now? Well, I, the, the issue when you have the kind of budget shortfall that Nasrallah is now facing is he's having to make some pretty tough decisions on where to cut. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the places that he's cutting is in his ability to, to fund uh, such a large number of, of fighting forces uh, globally. So he is cutting back and we are seeing manifestations of that. He's of course prioritized uh, funding the families of, of dead terrorists mm -hmm. and he wants to continue to make that a central uh, part of his budget. So uh, as the costs there continue to grow, his budget shortfall will, will be further exacerbated. Is, has, have you seen anything, um, uh, anyone stepping in to fill the void that um, you know, the departure of some, at least some Hezbollah forces from Syria um, has created in terms of, I don't know, additional um, Quds Force forces or Iraqi um, Shiite militias, or is this just something now that um, as the Assad regime consolidates its control of much of the country um, is being now taken on by, by Syrian forces? No, that you, that's a question the Department of Defense would have to answer. What I will tell you, however, is sometimes it's, it's a bit overlooked, but we in the Treasury continue our campaign to deny Assad finances. Uh, and we've taken action uh, in recent days against a, a network that he was using, including in the UAE, uh, to raise funds and move funds. And mm -hmm. that campaign continues unabated. Okay. I'd like to ask you about Iraq. Um, you know, the United States government has designated and sh uh, sanctioned a number of Iraqi militias. At the same time, many of those groups are tightly linked to um, the Iraqi government, which is a close American ally and um, form part of the Iraqi security forces. Um, how do, what's your approach to dealing with those political realities? And, um, you know, I think the, the tension that exists for the Iraqis that um, they uh, consider the American um, government um, may be a primary security ally, but Iran has deep cultural, social, religious ties and will be their neighbor forever. Mm -hmm. how, how, what's your approach to that? Well, the Iraqis sh certainly are a victim of geography in that respect. Uh, we have a good relationship. I have a good relationship with my Iraqi counterparts, uh, with the finance minister, with the central bank governor. Uh, they understand everything the United States does to assist the functioning of their economy. Uh, and we will continue to insist that when we uh, implement designations on those who facilitate 
QF or IRGC or uh, Hezbollah or other terrorist proxy uh, finances that uh, that we 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 it's not a negotiation we expect unequivocally that those sanctions will be honored and implemented as you may know we have designated uh, Aras Habib and Al Balad Bank which was at the time the third largest bank in Iraq for exactly these kinds of activities and we expect just as the case with Jamal Trust Bank that those accounts stay frozen and that the, pro the bank be liquidated in an orderly process that's consistent with international standards. Uh, but we've shown in that case that we will not hesitate to act, uh, even against a large financial institution with a politically connected member of parliament. And the Iraqi government is complying with that? Uh, we, yes, uh, but it's an ongoing topic uh, where we continue to make our view crystal clear. And what is their message to you when they say, look, we need, you know, we need electricity, we need, you know, we need to have trade relationships? Um, what do they tell you? And, and Well, I mean, look, we, we, we have not and, and are not uh, uh, prescribing every imaginable form of transaction with Iran. We've never targeted humanitarian uh, aid. We've never targeted foodstuffs or medicines. Uh, so those kinds of transactions are, are uh, things that are normal and, and, and expected. We understand that the Iraqi government and the Iraqi people are dependent uh, on Iran for electricity. And we have, I think, uh, arrived at a, at a good outcome on, on, uh, on the proper way to handle that. Uh, but we ultimately expect the government of Iraq to look out for its own interests. It's absolutely ridiculous that the Iraqi people are so beholden to Iran for electricity. Iraq is a net exporter of, of energy. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not a it's not a, a ludicrous thing to requ request that they move forward with becoming self sufficient with their own energy requirements. They have been trying to do so for a decade now, but there's very it's quite something that, though, right? Um, what is the response that you get from, or can, can you tell us a little bit about the interactions with your European allies um, on these issues and and. Um, what is the conversation like when you're trying to make sure that the measures that the United States hopes are taken vis-a-vis -vis Iranian companies and or um, uh, entities um, as they relate to Europe? Right. Well, so it's impossible to, to uh, characterize a single uh, set of interactions with quote-unquote Europe. Europe is a, a pretty diverse mm -hmm. place with a lot of different uh, uh, perspectives on the matter. We uh, have a number of NATO allies who completely understand our security concerns, acknowledge that the Iranians are in fact a terrorist regime, acknowledge that the Ministry uh, of Intelligence, the MOIS, has conducted assassinations on European soil uh, in the most horrific ways, uh, and who are supporting us. Uh, uh, on a lot of these uh, measures. We have excellent intelligence cooperation uh, with our NATO allies and, and partners. Mm -hmm. Uh, we do have a difference of opinion uh, with some, but by no means all, of the Europeans on uh, the right uh, way forward on the dip diplomatic front. Right. Um, but we'll continue to work together because at the end of the day, uh, I'm here at the Atlantic Council, <laughs> and transatlantic right. unity is something that, uh, that we really do strive for. Is there any way to characterize for the audience the extent to which, um, again, uh, a diverse group of countries and, and, um, and, and, c and circumstances that um, that European countries are abiding with and supporting and executing the, the steps that the United States would like them to take vis-a-vis -vis the Iranian pressure? Well, so uh, the vast majority of European countries, it wasn't actually a, a tough call for many of them because most of their big industries had taken a look at the Iranian market after the JCPOA and decided that it just, it's not, it, the reason Iran has so many problems with the FATF is that it is a, it is a non-transparent, highly corrupt business environment in Iran. And most of the European, the big European players had already decided that it wasn't worth the candle. Uh, so talking to those companies about the fact that, and we, we uh, engaged, you know, the president was very clear on his view on the JCPOA from day one. Mm -hmm. Even so, we gave all of these companies six months to wind down any particular business activities that they had, and pretty much they all have done so. Um, even in countries where, for whatever reason, the government itself um, uh, has taken a, a, a contrarian view to the U.S. position, uh, we have messaged directly to the private sector and made very, very clear to companies that, look, you can do business with Iran if you want. That's a business decision. It's a, it's a, but we hope you engage in an informed risk discussion within your company 
because if you trade with the Iranians in something that is sanctioned by the United States, we will cut you off from the U.S. financial system and you will not do business with us. Well, what about China? We've had the same dialogue with Chinese companies that we've had with Turkish companies, Indian companies, British companies, you name it. Okay. Um, I'd like to ask sort of a, a, a bigger picture question. Um, you know, there, there has been some reporting about the impact to ordinary Iranians of um, the American campaign, the, the maximum pressure campaign, and what the economic, the, the toll that has been taken on the Iranian economy and what that means for people who, you know, are not involved in um, the Quds Force or anything like that. Can you talk about how you all, what, um, to what extent you track that and, and to what extent, how do you take that into account when you're thinking about um, the measures that should be um, implemented, especially given the fact that, you know, the, the Iranian government has shown, as you suggested during your remarks, sort of um, low sensitivity to um, uh, the, you know, financial hardship um, that occurs for, for ordinary Iranians or maybe a, a higher willingness to, to, um, to move money around into the activity, the proxy activities. Well, I mean, that's a lack of respect for human rights is the call sign of all of these dictatorships, whether we're talking about Tehran or North Korea or Venezuela. Uh, they don't care about the, the people on the street. Uh, the Iranians have, the regime has uh, engaged in some of the most horrific uh, brutalities against student protesters. They, they have beaten people to death in prisons. Uh, uh, they have hammered down on the middle class. They, uh, there is no Iranian democracy. They won't allow moderate candidates to run for office. They have an entire elaborate system for denying people the ability to participate uh, in Iran. Everything at the end of the day is controlled by the supreme leader. And the supreme leader and his people have made the economy a basket case. Iran was having huge economic problems before the reimposition of sanctions because of this endemic corruption that runs throughout a society. You just have to read uh, Iranian press to see all of the graft and corruption that has bedeviled the Tehran municipality alone in which the IRGC was involved. Uh, so the Iranian people know this, and they well know that the root problem that the economy faces is this corruption and penetration of the economy by the supreme leader and his proxies in the IRGC. Uh, like I said, we have not targeted the kind of uh, uh, transactions that are necessary to support foodstuffs, a lot of the basic commodities that, that people need. If the Iranian regime is having problems importing this, these, these items in, it's simply because of their own gross mismanagement. But you do acknowledge that there is uh, an impact on ordinary Iranians to, you know, the, if this is the you know, most aggressive set of financial uh, me pressure measures that have been ever put in place vis-a-vis -vis Iran, there's, there's bound to be an impact absolutely. on, on absolutely. everyday and it, Iranians. And absolutely. And it is incumbent upon the supreme leader to recognize that he has an obligation to look out for his people and return to the negotiating table. And uh, just finally, um, you talked a little bit about the, um, the oil shipping measures that have been introduced. Um, how does that relate to the, you know, there's this operational sentinel that is now in place to um, uh, bring together different countries to try to um, patrol um, uh, waters in the Middle East to make sure that the IRGC isn't um, coming into contact in any problematic way with shipping. Um, it, so they seem to be able to do, continue to do the shipping, at least to Syria, is what you were suggesting in your remarks. Um, to what extent um, are you expecting there to be a big reduction in their illicit shipping activity? Well, we, we intend to make it so. So it was regrettable that Gibraltar let the vessel go uh, mm -hmm. on the basis of Iranian lies. Um, hopefully there won't be a repeat, but I think we very clearly demonstrated our ability to interdict um, this network uh, and our financial interdiction measures um, will, will intensify. As I mentioned, we have um, worked with the Department of State now to be able to offer uh, reward money to also arrest the, 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 the transportation uh, of uh, uh, this uh, oil for terror type of behavior. On top of that, uh, we've also in recent days uh, I mentioned that we engage with industry. One of the things we've done recently is issue a circular to industry, uh, again cautioning the shipping industry to beware of the kinds of fabrications and misrepresentations and obfuscations in which the Iranians engage as they operate this network. 
it is uh, it is important that the shipping industry take a take a learn a lesson from our designation of the Medi Group, which was uh, the Indian-based uh, uh, front company structure that was used to operate a lot of these Hezbollah-managed vessels. Mm -hmm. And for ship management companies that supply the crew, uh, because th these vessels are, are uh, rented tankers that are internationally crewed, and I think uh, these ship management companies have got to understand that if you don't conduct proper due diligence into who's really behind this shipment, and you put a captain on a vessel and a crew on a vessel, that violates EU sanctions laws when it comes to Syria, that violates U.S. sanctions laws, there will be consequences. Just one final very quick question before I open it up. Open it up. To what extent are they, um, are you seeing them move uh, some of these now um, affected um, economic activities into other, you know, other, uh, other countries or other organizations? Because I imagine they can do that to some extent and how quickly can you guys respond? Um, they are doing that. Uh, they have uh, uh, tried to relocate a lot of their sanctions evasion activities um, into jurisdictions uh, uh, far away. Uh, we follow them closely. I mentioned the intelligence cooperation we have with a huge number of partners. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we use our financial tools in tandem with many, many other efforts which sometimes are less obvious. Uh, but we are active in targeting them day in and day out. Great. All right. Well, I'm sure that there's a lot of questions here. Um, so if, um, uh, as Will said, please um, uh, identify yourself when you ask a question, your affiliation, and make sure that your question is a question. So the gentleman here in the second row. I don't know if we have a, we have a microphone. Don't worry. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Secretary, that was great. Good to see you again. Good to see you. I'm Timothy Towell. Uh, 30 years foreign service officer in the State Department, uh, United States Ambassador to Paraguay, where there were lots of bad hombres 30 years ago when I was there, and there are now. That's where the stuff started that you mentioned in your first sentence, the killing of 75 and 38 Jewish people in Buenos Aires by terrorists coming from the Trifrontera era, that's right. Brazil. Argentina, uh, Paraguay. Uh, I, my question is, are we doing enough on what you emphasized is the importance of international cooperation? Because this hemisphere, our neighborhood, is very dangerous today, and especially next month. The guys that came down from Paraguay and killed those people, I was gone by then, were terrorists. A few years after that, a wonderful uh, prosecutor in Paraguay, uh, in Argentina, went to see the president of Paraguay, a lady named Mrs. Kirchner, who happens to be the senator now, but candidate for vice president, right. and will be vice president next month, and she will have a wimpy president, so she'll run the show. She is the one when the prosecutor went and said, we're working on the terrorists, in the terrorist network from the Trifrontera era to Buenos Aires and killing people, and she blew him away. He was supposed to meet with her the next day, and they found him dead in his house. And they said, oh, he committed suicide. Wrong, he was killed, and the president of Argentina, who's gonna be the vice president in a month, said, no, I'm working with Iran, and Hezbollah works with Iran, so I'm not going after them. Pompeo was great. He was there a week, uh, a month ago. Argentina and Paraguay call him terrorists now. Calling somebody a terrorist doesn't do it. You gotta get down and do something. Why don't people get down and make sure that that senator, a killer, is not gonna be the next Peronist leader in that wonderful country of Argentina? So thanks for that question, Ambassador. Um, you know, the first question you had there, are we doing it enough? In fighting terrorism, you can never do enough. Uh, you, there's always more that must be done. Uh, I am, I was with Secretary Pompeo uh, there at the commemoration ceremony. Uh, it was actually at a s series of meetings that he had with counterparts from across the region that the, the President Makri uh, issued a presidential decree which, by the way, does a lot more than just call Te Hezbollah a terrorist group. It actually gives 
the Financial Intelligence Unit the ability to reach in and block financial assets associated with Hezbollah operatives. And they've actually done so. They've targeted a number of, specifically the EMEA uh, bombing uh, individuals. I'm not even going to call them suspects because they were clearly involved. Uh, but they've also uh, been working with us on additional targets. Paraguay, uh, the country where you ably led our diplomatic uh, representation uh, in the past, has also now followed suit. And we are working with them uh, to round out the financial dimensions to the presidential decree that they have issued. Likewise, we're in active discussions across the hemisphere uh, with Brazil, uh, because they play a key role in clamping down on the use of the tri-border area for Hezbollah financing. Um, in recent days, this doesn't necessarily get a lot of attention, but there has been an excellent degree of cooperation between the three nations in disrupting the Barakat clan, which is a Hezbollah business operation in the tri-border area, and actually getting some of those individuals not just arrested but extradited uh, to the United States, to Argentina, and other places. So that the cooperation in the region is, is good. It's intensifying. We obviously are following the, uh, the Argentinian election closely. Uh, and, uh, and we'll continue to work away at this. But we do, Latin America is turning against Hezbollah, albeit slowly, but inevitably. Hezbollah will find that Latin America is a denied area to them because of the violence they've practiced. Panama alone, we caught them surveilling the canal, right? So it would be very helpful for some of these, uh, these governments to go ahead and designate this group for what it is as a terrorist organization. I think we had a question here in the, first, in the front row. Uh, yes, hi, uh, Joyce Garam with The National. Thanks, Missy. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Billingsley. Um, I have two quick questions. One, um, you know, there was a report two days ago that uh, the president is flirting with the French pro uh, proposal to give Iran uh, the $15 billion credit line uh, if a meeting with Rouhani were to happen. Uh, would that undermine sanctions and what do you think about the proposal generally? And my second question on Lebanon, uh, when you talk about private businessmen, businesswomen, uh, you know, helping, supplementing Hezbo Hezbollah, uh, can you be a bit more clear? Are you looking at, uh, you know, people from the private sector uh, across sectarian lines in Lebanon, across uh, party lines? Thanks. Thanks. Um, I'll, on the first question, I'll, I'll refer you to the White House, but uh, our, our course remains constant uh, and unchanged in terms of the, the efforts to degrade Iranian finances. When it comes to Lebanon, uh, this has never been about any particular religious or ethnic identity. This is not about the Lebanese Shia community. This is about Hezbollah. And if you are a collaborator with Hezbollah, regardless of your political party or your ideological affiliation or your religious background, and you are materially assisting them, we're going to target you. Hezbollah uh, engages in a wide range of illicit business activities in Lebanon well outside of the financial sector, I alluded to a few of them, but pharmaceuticals come to mind, uh, abuse of free trade zones, the abuse of, of the airport and the seaports. Um, these are all areas where it's incumbent upon good government in Lebanon to take <coughs> back control of, of their own country. And we look forward to working very closely with the Lebanese government along those lines. All right, in the back row, in the corner. Ian Talley, Wall Street Journal. Good to see you. Um, public uh, reporting most of suggests that uh, there are more like 12 or more, including the central bank, uh, uh, handling Hezbollah uh, uh, accounts, including on uh, companies that are, are known to owned by uh, uh, confessed Hezbollah uh, agents. Uh, why not cut them all off from the U.S. dollar? What, uh, what risk do you see in that? Uh, they're all correspondent, uh, all have correspondent accounts in New York. Um, secondly, given the, uh, you said 700 million from, from, um, from Tehran, uh, given the global activity of Hezbollah uh, controlled uh, and contracted 
um, operations that seem to me run in the billions of dollars globally. Uh, is that number really significant? Uh, I, yeah, we'll leave it at that. Yeah. And can I get 10 million? <laughs> <laughs> it's good to see you, Ian. Um, so, so your question was with regard to allegations regarding banks inside Lebanon, uh, if, I, if I heard you correctly. So look, um, it's, we, we have to be careful to, to be very precise because no bank and no financial system is full, foolproof or fail safe. Uh, that's why we have AML CFT regimes that banks have to implement. Uh, I meet routinely with the, uh, the bankers from across Lebanon. I meet with the, uh, the banking, uh, the ABL, the banking uh, uh, organization. I'm, I'm looking forward to actually meeting the new chairman, uh, 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 if he's able to, to make it uh, to DC or if I can see him in Lebanon, uh, who is the chairman of the Bank of Beirut. Um, th the, the challenge we face is that Hezbollah engages in some pretty sophisticated financial engineering uh, to hide uh, uh, what they're really up to. And it's less uh, about requiring uh, that we catch them at each and every turn and more about making sure that when a bank discovers that they have inadvertently allowed some kind of, uh, a, a, of penetration of the financial institution to occur, that they rapidly solve the problem. And that's the way we have to deal with it. This is Lebanon's problem. We have the same issues we work on here in the United States with narcotics traffickers and, and other kinds of, of, of issues. So I think we have to be very mindful of the fact that the international financial system is vulnerable, it is interconnected, and the key, the key barometer is whether a given country's uh, supervisors uh, are able and willing, do they have the political will and do they have the capacity, and can they demonstrate that they're, excuse me, that they are stepping up to the challenge. And I will tell you in the case of Lebanon, we have this confidence. I have a great working relationship with the central bank governor and with his uh, supervisory team. Uh, he is under an enormous amount of pressure. I mentioned the fact that he has been physically threatened by uh, Nasrallah's mafia-type thugs. Uh, they have also threatened other bankers. They planted a bomb outside of Blum Bank a few years ago because the bank expunged uh, Hezbollah from its roles. So we're very mindful of the fact that this is an organization that will assassinate prime ministers to say nothing of bankers in Lebanon. That said, when we find a bank like Jamal Trust Bank that brazenly and knowingly colluded with Hezbollah to funnel money, we will not hesitate to ask and to, to act. And the financial consequences are what they are. But at the end of the day, it is very important that the Lebanese people realize that it is Nasrallah and Hezbollah causing this risk to Lebanon, not the United States. It's not billions. It's just not billions. It's, there is additional money on top of what they get from the Iranians. And what we believe is that just as he has gone on his telethons uh, uh, domestically, we, we expect that the call has gone out to his business operatives around the world to generate more funds for him. That's why we are, as I mentioned to the ambassador, so focused on the tri-border area, but there are other jurisdictions. We have disrupted them. Uh, Tabaja's network has been disrupted in West Africa. Bazi's network we took down in the Gambia. We're working on, on his European footprint as well. He tried to hide his business operations under his son, Wail Bazi. We've designated him and his business concerns. We're chasing up this money around the world and we will not stop. In the second row. I'm Faye Mokhtadra, I'm a member of Atlantic Council. Thank you, sir, for such a great talk. Uh, as an Iranian American, my question to you is, don't you think this uh, maximum pressure policy in order to be effective will be if we ease the sanctions and bring the Iranians to the table and somehow renegotiate uh, the JCPOA? Uh, this maximum pressure, I can rest assure you that is not very effective on the IRGC and also the Iranian government. It only affects the average Iranian uh, on the streets and um, we have you know, put sanctions on Iran for the past 40 years, and I can rest assure you that the Iranian government have uh, got a PhD in going around uh, these economic sanctions. So in order to address the Hezbollah, which is a big issue for Americans, and also the Syrian uh, issues, 
uh, the best, in your expert opinion, would not be to bring the Iranians at the table, renegotiate the JCPOA, and then address these issues that concern the United States. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for the question. I think you and I probably have a difference of opinion on the right way to sequence things, but uh, the goal has always been to compel the regime to change its behavior and return to the negotiating table uh, to stop the terrorism, to stop the ballistic missile program, uh, and to agree to a nuclear deal that actually doesn't have such glaring pitfalls or, or blind spots in it as the previous one did, just, just like the sunset clause alone. That's the goal. The goal has always been a change in behavior. That's what we're seeking to achieve. Uh, but until we see that change in behavior, uh, the pressure campaign will continue. All right, the woman in the white blazer in the back right there. Yeah. Do you need a, a microphone? Okay. Yeah. It's Sada Shadid from LBCI uh, TV from Lebanon. Uh, according to US uh, policy, uh, uh, sanctions on Hezbollah is justified. But expanding uh, these sanctions to include supporters uh, from uh, Shiit community or from other sects uh, may uh, affect the stability in Lebanon, uh, on which the U.S. is keen on preserving. How does it work? And another question, are there new measures uh, to tighten the sanctions more, uh, to what extent does the U.S. Uh, believe the sanctions are effi uh, effective? And the last question, uh, the Lebanese bank have abided with uh, U.S. measures, but Jamal Trust Bank was blacklisted, and this might shake the banking si uh, system. Are there any mes measures to limit this damage let me start with the last question and work backwards if I can remember okay. all of the questions. Remind me if I forget something. Uh, so Jamal Trust Bank um, was not what we would call a systemically important bank. Uh, it was, I think, around 26th or so on the banking side. Um, there is a, a liquidity problem that the bank has, of course, because uh, of what they were doing. They were violating uh, Lebanon's own uh, uh, laws with regard to money laundering. Uh, they were lying to the central bank about who they were transacting with. Uh, and uh, the governor has undertaken the necessary steps to bring the bank under central bank control and to begin the liquidation process. Uh, these are always complicated issues, but from, from what we see, uh, the, right, the right approach is being taken. There was uh, innocent money people that are innocent Shia uh, uh, citizens of the country who had money in that bank. Uh, and it is outrageous that the, ban the, the bank managers would jeopardize innocent people's money in this way by taking on all of this other terrorist funding. The, the government of Lebanon understands that there is innocent money tied up in there and they are moving, I think, in the right way to identify legitimate accounts uh, so that people can, can get their funds back while at the same time keeping both the bank accounts itself and the Hezbollah money frozen, and that is key. If we see Hezbollah money exiting that bank, we're going to have issues. Um, in terms of the overall uh, uh, political situation in Lebanon, Lebanon is a democracy, and we respect that fact very much, and, and that's the whole point here, is to ensure uh, that the Lebanese people decide uh, uh, who runs the country. Uh, we have excellent working relationships um, with, with the Prime Minister and the President, as well as I've mentioned, obviously, the financial sector. Uh, but it is going to be very incumbent that all key players in, in Lebanon understand that if you provide material support to Hezbollah, regardless of your political party, regardless of your ideology, your religion, your ethnic background, you are at risk. And the Treasury Department may well target you. I would not forecast such a thing, even if I, even if I could. There's a, the gentleman um, with the blue blazer who's sitting down, yeah, in the, I think, second to last row, yeah. Do you want to stand up so they can see where you are? Thanks. Thank you. My name is Bassam Barbandi. I'm from Syria. My question as a Lebanon, if we make Lebanon as not special case, as trend, as model, uh, you were asking the Lebanese government to push back against Hezbollah. 
and you are supporting the, by sanctioning. My question to you, how you are supporting the Lebanese people to do this, what you are providing them, the parties, the people, and the government? So you cannot just ask them to act. We still remember the Hezbollah and Syrian regime. They killed Rafiq Hariri. They killed mm -hmm. Samir Qasir. They killed so many people who were against uh, Iran. Mm -hmm. And nowadays, the people in their mind, they remember that when they act, they will be killed. And at the same time, uh, they are under pressure from the United States to act. So this is the equation that needs to be filled. Other question regarding Hezbollah in Syria. Uh, I think Hezbollah, they have their own financial resources inside Syria. They are subcontracting with the government. They have smuggling. Uh, they, they do a lot of things. So how you you act on this? So it's easy to, to follow them in Paraguay and other parts. But where they are in Syria, they have the money in a way. Right. Thank you. So uh, I think it's really important to stress that the United States government, the whole of our government, has a a uh, deep relationship with the, the government of Lebanon across the full spectrum of, of activities. There's an enormous amount of collaboration and support that the Department of Defense and U.S. Central Command uh, provide to the Lebanese Armed Forces. Uh, there are a wide range of uh, assistance programs that the United States, uh, the Department of State and AID have. The World Bank uh, provides a, a number of uh, assistance programs. The entire CEDRA conference uh, that was hosted uh, 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 in Paris uh, to examine additional investment opportunities in water, in electricity, and so on was something uh, robustly supported by the United States. And so we have a close partnership on all of these issues. But we have every expectation that the Lebanese government will expunge this terrorist cancer from its body politic. This is an organization with the blood, not just of hundreds of Americans, Argentinians and others on its hands, but the blood of Lebanese people as well. And so we do expect that we will work together to preclude this terrorist group and to drive them back uh, from where they are today. Are you the first, the front row? Heba Nasr Sky News, Arabia. Uh, you said that you may sanction the Houthis if they engage. No, uh, I did not say uh, that. You, you may designate the Houthis if they uh, are if they are engaging in activities that are related to terrorism. Yeah, look, I'm very precise here. We don't designate ethnic groups, right? We designate individuals who engage in terroristic behavior. Okay, there okay. are videos for the Houthis raising money for Hezbollah. So uh, since you are, uh, since Hezbollah is desig designated as a terrorist organization and you are going after the Lebanese and the Lebanese sector and the Lebanese government, so you don't think you are putting too much pressure on the Lebanese and you can go after the people or after the resources for Hezbollah from outside Lebanon? We are going after Hezbollah income outside of Lebanon very actively. Uh, I mentioned West Africa. I mentioned uh, the tri-border area in Paraguay, I mentioned Europe, um, wherever we see it, wherever we find it. Uh, but is there such a thing as too much pressure against terrorism? I would argue there's not. Thank okay, you. Yeah, in the blue blazer, right there. Yeah. Alan Dargham from MTV Lebanon, how are you? Good to see you. Uh, so, Assistant Secretary David Shaker last night in a televised uh, interview, he said that he's going to uh, also target names that are allies with Hezbollah, not only for their financial activities with them or giving them support financially, also politically. And also, uh, you met with the delegations, Lebanese delegations, uh, throughout the year, and you give them guarantee that probably Taya or like uh, Basile's uh, political party or Amal will not be targeted. But as the secretary gave another fact uh, last night, technically speaking, is it like political decision will be if they want to put any uh, sanctions on the, on these two groups will be through the State Department or different uh, mechanism or technology? So I, I want to be very clear. I, I don't I don't give guarantees on anything, right? Uh, there was some speculation uh, that I tamped down. Um, we are not uh, targeting ethnic groups. I just mentioned the Houthis, but we're not targeting the Shia community either. We're targeting Hezbollah and those who enable Hezbollah to perform its, its terror ap apparatus. 
I don't care what political party you're from or what ethnic background you have or what religion you have, if you are giving material support to Hezbollah, you are by definition a terrorist in your own right and you will be targeted by the Department of the Treasury. So I haven't seen uh, Assistant Secretary Schenker's comments, but his office and mine work very, very closely together. And we, of course, follow the Department of State's lead on all of the foreign policy dimensions to this very complicated issue. Uh, and, uh, and I'll leave it at that. Okay, the gentleman in the pink shirt right there in the aisle. Um, hi, my name is Gaurav Singh. I'm with the Center for International Policy. Thank you for your time. Um, you mentioned um, the U.S. aid to the Lebanese Armed Forces. Um, so U.S. has provided LAF with $1.6 billion plus aid since 2006. Now, there are reports that a significant part of the Lebanese Armed Forces is comprised of people of a Shiite background who, you know, it's, it's not easy to determine where, um, where, they're, um, where they pledge their al allegiance, whether it's with um, Hezbollah or with the LAF. There are reports that say there are close ties between the two as well. At the same time, Hezbollah is getting a degree of institutional support, whether this is comments from the president saying that they are, a, quote unquote, they have major and essential role in defense apparatus. Nasrallah also characterized LAF as a partner and pillar, quote unquote. Um, the UN Security Council Resolution 1701 obligates the Lebanese Armed Forces to disarm all armed groups in Lebanon, which they have at a large degree not, not complied with. Now I know this isn't giving material support, but I'd argue that ignoring something as serious as this um, leads to the same, same um, effect. Now if the US is giving the LAF aid with the aim to reduce Hezbollah's relative presence, I'd say largely it hasn't worked. They're, they're gaining presence, their military is still far ahead of LAF. Now, if this someday my prince will come strategy isn't working, do you believe it is time to start conditioning this aid or to put more checks and balances in the system that can actually counter Hezbollah rather than just providing aid which doesn't really show much like progress? So you know, you're, you're asking a great uh, set of questions. The integrity of the LAF is of the utmost importance, uh, not just to the United States, but to President Aoun as well. And we've discussed this. Uh, and it is important that, uh, that the LAF ensure that uh, there is not penetration uh, of its ranks by Hezbollah or that it's not otherwise uh, uh, colluding uh, or engaging with Hezbollah. And so we, we very much, just as we have the same expectation on the banking side and the financial system, we have the same expectation uh, with the Lebanese Armed Forces. But I will tell you that uh, our Department of Defense feels uh, uh, very, uh, very good about the relationship and very close um, with the LAF and the key role that they play. All right. I think the final question right here, the gentleman in the glasses. Thanks. Uh, Nick Wadhams with Bloomberg. Uh, so far, the administration has largely, largely shied away from uh, targeting the big Chinese banks, People's Bank of China, given, um, I suppose, the concerns about the broader financial impact. Could you explain why that is um, in light of fairly strong evidence that some of the big Chinese banks um, have been involved in financing Iranian uh, oil imports, uh, also regards to uh, North Korea and dealings with the North Korean government. Is there a concern that, that the impact would just be too great on the global economy, or what's next for in terms of that? Uh, so I think we, we have shown with a number of our actions, including in the Russian context uh, with Rusal, that there is no such thing as too big, too big to be targeted. Um, I probably won't stray into a North Korea discussion today. That's a whole <laughs> set of uh, issues we could talk about um, there. Uh, I, I, actually, I wouldn't overstate um, any kind of uh, complicity by, by large uh, uh, Chinese banks in, with respect to Iran and the oil trade. Um, we've been talking with and working with the Chinese government um, on the uh, payment mechanisms that were being used uh, prior to the expiration of the waivers. 
uh, and the, the fact that we do expect uh, importation of Iranian oil to go to zero uh, and to understand financially how the funds that were previously associated with oil purchases uh, that were uh, allowed under the waivers previously, how those funds are, are handled. Um, so there are Chinese institutions, but those were institutions that we acknowledged at the time of the waivers. Uh, and now we're working uh, with the, the government to, um, to take the next step to really drive down uh, importation of, of oil. It would, of course, be unacceptable for us to see uh, uh, any kind of surge in, in Chinese importation of oil. Uh, just as it's unacceptable to see um, these tankers slipping through on their way to Syria. All right. Well, I want to um, respect our time constraint here and thank everyone for showing up here today for such an interesting and informative conversation. Of course, thank Assistant Secretary Billingsley as well. Thank you.